Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Ahead of next week's beginning of the month of Ramadan, the Middle East is apparently anxiously awaiting to see whether last-minute developments are signaling a short-term period of a respite from the violence which engulfed the Arab-Israeli divide in recent months, also branching south to the Red Sea and east to an indirect Iranian-American confrontation or flare-up into a broader regional fire. How do experts assess the threat to the Middle East as winter makes way to spring and the Holy Land prepares for Ramadan, Easter, and Passover? Joining us to dissect these matters all the way from Washington, D.C. is Dr. Michael Duran, who formerly served as U.S. National Security Council uh, Senior Director for the Middle East and North Africa, and currently, of course, a senior fellow of the Hudson Institute. It's good to see you, sir. Great to be here. Thank you. Also joining us from Northern Israel is Major General in Reserve, Gail Shona Cohen, who is an IDF Army Corps commander and uh, formerly also commanded uh, the Israeli Defense Colleges, among others. It's good to see you as well, General. Good to see you as well. Yeah. Great. And with me in the studio, of course, our TV7 editor at large, Mr. Amil Oren. Amil, set a stage for us. Jonathan, let me suggest, uh, perhaps in, in a crude way, um, a catchphrase to encapsulate uh, your question on whether uh, we are headed into a regional conflagration or into some respite. Park or spark? Are the military forces, the IDF, Hamas, and then Hezbollah, going to park for a while before fighting uh, resumes? Or is the Hamas uh, onslaught on Israel on October the 7th, now five months later, going to be the spark which ignites a regional fire? We are still several days from knowing the answer because as would happen in all labor disputes, negotiations before uh, a war starts, one can go back even to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, where the ambassador to Washington was presenting the, the final parts of the cable from Tokyo as the bombs fell, or the uh, meeting between uh, James Baker and Tarek Aziz a week before the war started in January of 1991. So it's, it's still up in the air, um, and um, it would not be... Um, smart to put a bet on it. Hopefully, it will be resolved uh, over the next several days. The uh, earliest deadline was really not the start of Ramadan, but the uh, Biden speech on the State of the Union, Thursday, March the 7th, in which he hoped to be able to announce an achievement. This is still uh, a couple of days away. If not then, maybe by Ramadan. Well, when we're looking at uh, that aspect, of course, there's always the factor of wishful thinking. Nevertheless, we're talking here about a high-intensity war in the Gaza Strip, low-intensity war between Israel and Lebanon, and also low-intensity low war with global ramifications, particularly in the Red Sea with uh, the Iranian octopus, of course, hard at play, Dr. Duran. I'd... I'm very intrigued to hear what you have to say at this moment in time about the various challenges at hand and the intricacies that have uh, pretty much gone out of control to a certain degree. Nonetheless, there are extensive efforts by the current Biden administration to try and de-escalate. Uh, well, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, the you you put your you know, you, the word you chose, de-escalate, is a loaded word, and it, it really requires, uh, or it behooves us to think about it a little bit. The The Biden administration says that its policy in general is one of uh, depressurizing, de-escalating, and ultimately integrating the, the Middle East. These are their words. What those actually mean, depressurize, de-escalate, and integrate, they mean arriving at a strategic accommodation between Tehran and Washington. The United States wants to de-escalate all of the conflicts between Iran's proxies and America's uh, allies. And it does this 
by putting the United States in the role of a, a mediator between those proxies and America's, uh, and America's allies. It's doing that everywhere in the Middle East. So between the, the Houthis, Iran's proxy in Yemen, and the, and, the, and, the, and the Saudis. In Lebanon, between Hezbollah and the Israelis. This is the Amos Hochstein initiative. It's doing it everywhere except Gaza. Gaza is the one area in the Middle East where the United States has given um, almost a blank check to an American ally to, uh, to push back against an Iranian proxy. But in the last few weeks especially, we see growing frustration on the side of the Americans um, with that policy. They would like there to be a ceasefire uh, because, uh, uh, because the support for Israel is costing Biden uh, 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 in in uh, domestic politics with his progressive base, which doesn't like Israel and wants to have a, a quiet uh, negotiations with Iran to settle all the problems in the region, but uh, 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 but also it's costing Biden with Iran. Uh, if if this continues, if this um, uh, um, horizontal escalation that Iran has orchestrated, and by that I mean use of the Houthis, use of Hezbollah use of uh, the proxies in Iraq and Syria against Israel and against the United States. Uh, if that continues, then at some point the United States is going to have to carry out aggressive countermeasures that are going to spoil its relationship with Tehran. So far, the Americans have been very careful in their reactions to the, in their military reactions to the provocations from the Houthis and from others not to target Iranians directly. In the news today here in the United States, we hear that the Iranians are, are using um, uh, assassins or recruiting assassins on the ground in the United States to carry out attacks against former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo um, uh, and others. The United States wants to, dis the, the Biden administration wants to disaggregate all of these things, treat them each as a separate issue. Uh, you know, Yemen is a separate file, His, uh, Lebanon is a separate file, the assassins on America's soil are a separate file, right. instead of aggregating them and treating them as a contest with Iran. All the while in Algiers, we saw the president of Algeria hosting Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and signing a memorandum of understanding on deepening cooperation in the sectors of oil and gas, something that obviously is heavily sanctioned by the United States, which just shows once again uh, your case uh, being uh, highlighted here that uh, the Iranians are floating. They're doing whatever they want, wherever they want, and there is no accountable to their actions. Not, nevertheless, when we're looking from Israel's perspective at this moment in time, General Akohen, uh, hostilities are taking place as uh, we're speaking, just uh, uh, less than half an hour ago, there were a number of projectiles that were fired from Lebanon towards Israel, targeting also, among others, uh, or striking uh, civilian infrastructure. Uh, thankfully, the family was evacuated uh, from that area before the attack. Nonetheless, uh, there is an outcry in the northern population of Israel to contend with this Iranian challenge to the north, namely via its proxy Hezbollah. Actually, uh, the Israeli situation in a definite crisis. Since uh, the decision uh, to evacuate the residents, we are not suffering uh, uh, almost not at all people uh, injured or killing or killed, but Yet, the very fact that Hezbollah going on to threaten all the northern arena of Israel, more than 60,000 residents are actually refugees in Israel, not at all getting now even an idea about how to calculate their life. Maybe they will not succeed to open the new year of studying in school in one of, one of September. Um, and they have to be aware now about what's going on in August, September. So it is in absolute uncertainty, and it is a huge embarrassment for Israel. It never happened before, and now that we are just in the entrance of Ramadan, 
we must, as uh, Mike Duran emphasized, pay attention to Tehran because they have been the first to connect Jerusalem and Quds to the last Friday of Ramadan, uh, defined it and dedicated that Friday to be the day of Al-Aqsa and Al-Quds. By that, they succeeded to bridge between Sunnah and Shia. And actually, this creating uh, the glue to connect the whole region, not only just against the front of Israel, but against the religious nuclear reactor, uh, uh, metaphorically, in Jerusalem, El uh, Aqsa and Mount of Temple. And how really we will succeed to do that without getting a kind of agreement uh, explicitly or implicitly between United States and Tehran, Hezbollah are waiting to that, and maybe it will not be achieved without the influence of China. I don't know how really the Americans can uh, achieve an understanding together with China regarding this issue. And I think that without China uh, pushing Tehran to change their policy now, uh, no a real new horizon appearing to all that complicated uh, issue. Indeed. Well, Mr. Oren, of course, uh, when we're looking northward, we can also look to the war between Russia and Ukraine. The Russians are making gains. And uh, we're seeing that it, it is emboldening this uh, axis, namely Russia, uh, Iran, China, North Korea, Venezuela, and others that are operating in that same scheme. And China, uh, it seems like in the South China Sea, things are heating up, uh, all of which, of course, is interconnected in one fashion or another. And therefore, what is the interest of Russia and China to hold Iran back at a time when they would be more than happy for additional diversions? It's uh, perhaps uh, not necessarily the diversion uh, which they are looking for. And uh, the connection um, uh, is uh, seen even in the uh, congressional action, which ties aid to Israel with aid to Ukraine, at least in the uh, democratic uh, uh, proposal which uh, the Republicans For other are, reasons. are fighting. Yes, but uh, of course, uh, it's in order to facilitate uh, the, uh, the vote. But um, um, just uh, to add to uh, what General Cohen said, as we all remember, on October the 7th, Hamas called its attack Al-Aqsa flood. It tried from the very mm. first day to make the connection between Al-Aqsa and their attack, as they did in May of 2021, uh, when uh, for the first time they also launched rockets at the Jerusalem area. This is mind-boggling. It they was done as well. Yes, of course. They, they, are, they are trying to portray themselves as guardians of Al-Aqsa, but they launched rockets which are not precise, may very well have hit Al-Aqsa, and apparently they relied on the accuracy of Iron Dome. Had Iron Dome not been there, the Israeli system, maybe their holy place, Al-Aqsa, would have been hit by Hamas. Of course, they would have said that Israel uh, did it. So this is just um, as an aside. Now, in addition to what uh, uh, all of us said, one should ask, what can Israel do to minimize tension? Um, there is a very interesting piece um, on the website of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy by Nomi Neumann, who used to be the chief of analysis, research, and assessment for Shabak, the internal security agency. And obviously, she still has her sources and perhaps is expressing a view similar to what is now. Um, can now be found uh, at uh, Shabak. And she reminds us that uh, in the uh, West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, unemployment has risen, it's especially um, in the uh, very vulnerable ages to incitement, from 12 or 13% to 
to more than 30 percent. There is neither an economic horizon nor a political one, so it is very easy to push people who otherwise wouldn't have committed acts of terror to do it, especially if East Jerusalem, uh, Al-Aqsa, all of the Muslim uh, world, if they are combined, and that the security services uh, of the Palestinian Authority suffered um, a salary cut. Officers there, too, are frustrated and therefore may not be as motivated to help in foiling uh, or helping uh, Israel to foil uh, terror acts. So this is why the uh, Israeli cabinet overrode Minister Itamar Ben-Gvir and decided to, to lessen the restrictions on Israeli Arabs and others coming to pray on Haram al-Sharif during uh, Ramadan. The Temple Mount, with that being said, it also could be seen from another angle. Some may say, and I hear more and more uh, senior officials, both uh, generals in the military as well as uh, senior uh, officials and, and practitioners in uh, Mossad and, and Shabak, uh, coming out and highlighting the fact that uh, in order to challenge uh, the, the understanding of the Arab street, which is very engaged in survival, always conducting themselves, people need to understand it's not a democracy in the Middle East, people are dealing with the totalitarian regimes with different intricacies that are not uh, existing in the West. Of course, today, if you go to London and Paris, it might uh, well be the same. But nonetheless, we're, we're looking here from another prism, and that is they're looking at what is happening in Gaza. And if Israel persists and eradicates the Islamist Hamas and deals it a decisive blow in a fashion that is for everybody to see, this may deter also the actions in the street throughout uh, the so-called West Bank, uh, namely Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley. Dr. Duran, what is your perspective on that? Well, um, before when I was talking about Tehran and Washington, it's because I think that this actually uh, uh, this actually has an influence on Yahya Sinwar sitting in his tunnels in, in Rafah or Khan Yunus, wherever he is right, right, right now. Um, we're we're hearing in the Israeli press that um, that the that Hamas is not answering, uh, giving uh, serious answers to the um, um, proposals that Israel has made for a for a ceasefire. Um, no concrete answers on key aspects such as the ratio between uh, prisoners that Israel is holding for hostages that Hamas is holding and uh, and so on. And the understanding is that that Sinwar is going to is playing to the Arab street, as you say. He's looking forward to the start of Ramadan. He's hoping that the, there will be uh, there'll be demonstrations in the West. There'll be uh, unrest, if not extreme violence, uh, on the West Bank. Uh, maybe fueled by uh, new kinds of weapons from uh, Iran that uh, th that have been smuggled into the West Bank and um, and so on, but all of this is uh, in a way abetted by an American policy that is showing more and more frustration with Israel. The more you know, the Vice President Kamala Harris just said. Um, uh, um, the day before yesterday, or uh, yesterday, I can't remember when it was already, uh, that uh, we need to see a ceasefire. We have to see a ceasefire. If you're Sinwar and you see the Americans putting pressure on the Israelis for a ceasefire at a moment when Hamas is refusing to, uh, to put forth a serious proposal, you say, hey, why not? Why, well, let's see what we can get. Let's see what violence we can generate uh, around the Middle East, in Europe, on the West Bank, and that will pressure the Americans more. And, and, and then I can get more concessions from the Israelis because ultimately the key to getting concessions from the Israelis for, for, uh, from Hamas's point of view is American policy. Ultimately, it all comes down to, the, to what Washington is going to do. General Cohen, I'd love to hear your perspective also on Judea and Samaria and the various intricacies also oh, in relation... Just follow the Mike Durane last uh, sentence. Please. Uh, the negotiation with Hamas, uh, guided by Americans, uh, French, uh, uh, Qatar, Egyptians, of course, uh, is not taking place in isolated laboratory conditions. It is absolutely influenced by the whole atmosphere. And actually, 
the understanding of Hamas and those who are representing Hamas, that Israel coming to be under more pressure from United States and maybe from Europe really uh, could bring the negotiation to a dead end or to bring it to a huge frustration regarding the Israeli expectations to see hostages because even uh, Kamala Harris must admit that it is necessary to connect uh, the negotiation about ceasefire with really a possibility to bring uh, 40 or even more uh, hostages, if not for what Israel will admit to make uh, a ceasefire. So the ceasefire is absolutely dependent on that. On the other side, the price that Hamas are raising now is quite impossible, and I don't know how it could really be solved. Regarding the Judean Samaria uh, population, I'm really speaking with a lot of them. Just today I had a conversation with a very respected person in, Mount, in Hebron Mountain. Uh, we must realize that if more than 100,000 workers since 7th of October not going to walk in Israel and each one of them feeding 10 people, it means that million uh, Palestinian residents in Judea and Somalia are really now suffering. And before Ramadan, it is absolutely required to bring food, to have capability to pay, and it is a crisis. Indeed. Uh, Israel has a responsibility here, obviously, to facilitate uh, different uh, social aspects and economic aspects in order to also alleviate the tensions on the ground. Nevertheless, Mr. Owen, when I look, and we don't have very much time left, but nonetheless, it's an important topic. I'm going back to a statement by Vice Admiral Bradford Cooper, uh, who came out and, and highlighted during uh, the, the 60 Minutes program, it's not a matter of whether the U.S. Uh, Central Command or military is capable of executing and degrading uh, various threats to the point of no return. It's about a decision. It's about policy. And uh, we see now more and more European actors. The European Union launched its own task force. Uh, we see the, the uh, Greek and the Germans and, and other uh, countries throughout Europe sending vessels to contend with a Houthi threat. They're actively doing so. The French have been already there since day one, but it has global implications, and the joint U.S.-British, with the assistance, of course, of the Netherlands, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and uh, Bahrain. Denmark, too. Denmark, uh, well, Denmark uh, is a latecomer. Uh, there is here a que uh, quite the, the calculus in which... Uh, the the superpower of this world is not able to deal with a small tribe. But you have yourself supplied the reason. If it's a coalition of the willing, what are they willing to do? Are they willing to support the United States in a direct confrontation with Iran? Or do they agree only on a limited definition of the operation? Apparently, it's the latter. Indeed. Well, with regard to the Red Sea, we have roughly one and a half minutes for each of you. Dr. Duran, the floor is yours. Very simply, the United States, under the influence of uh, President Obama and President Biden, uh, and not reversed by Trump, dismantled the system, the alliance system that we had for containing Iran and its proxies. If you want to contain Iran, you don't have to hit every missile site in Yemen but you have to build up the forces in Yemen that are hostile to the Houthis. But the United States dismantled the, the Saudi coalition that was designed to do that. Instead of supporting it, it dismantled it. Right now, Iran is building up forces in, uh, building up strength in Sudan, looking for a port in Sudan. That's gonna surround Saudi Arabia with Iranian power. It's gonna surround the Red Sea with Iranian power. What is the United States doing to counter that? Nothing. There's, there needs to be a complete rethinking uh, of our alliance system and the paradigm with which we treat Iran. The Biden administration desperately wants to reach a strategic accommodation with Iran, and it keeps offering it over and over again 
a policy of mutual non-belligerency. That's what it wants. And Iran is, Iran is willing to pocket everything that the, every de-escalation that America gives it and then create a new position of strength from which it can threaten the United States and its allies. Sooner or later, this will, this, this won't, uh, uh, this, this will fall apart. I'm surprised it's lasted as long as it has, but I think we have a long way to go before it really does fall apart. Another country that I think is very important to focus on is Somalia, where we're seeing the tensions mounting between the two sides, and we're seeing that the chief rival of Iran, if we're looking historically, namely Turkey, is holding the Iranians back there, and that is quite the, the significant print at this point. I totally, I totally agree. Uh, personally, I think that we should be thinking of uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan as counterbalances to Iran. Uh, this is not a this is not a position that is uh, popular in Washington on the right or on the left. Uh, so uh, I, I kind of hesitate to go to go talking about that because uh, people turn off the minute they hear that. But let's just uh, let's just establish the principle that we're not going to contain Iran by being nice to it. General Hakoy, of course, I agree, and it is either or. Either the United States will succeed to bring an interest, a very definite interest to Iran to stop this attack of the Houthis in the Red Sea, or they will be required to act directly with land forces, with marine divisions to take the beaches. Without that, they will never succeed, as we all learned in the last decade. Um, air power in itself is not enough. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Duran, General Aquin, and Mr. Oren. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem, Shalom. TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.